Good morning. Welcome to Oak Street Baptist Church this morning. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're glad that you're here. I, I see a lot of smiling faces out there. Let's all stand together. And we're going to bring uh, everybody in here with a worship song this morning. Today, Pastor Joe is talking about the Word of God. So all of the songs this morning are about the Word of God. Uh, just reminding us of some of the stories in the Word of God. And I hope that, uh, that these songs become... Uh, just truths that are written on our hearts and that you understand that God is faithful and His promises are true. God of Abraham the God of covenant, the faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven to do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And then my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. Great to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same, yeah. history can prove, there's nothing you can't do, you're faithful and true. Sing, great is your faithfulness.
Amen. You may, you may have a seat this morning. It's good to see you here today. My name is Stephen. I'm the student and counseling pastor here, and I'd like to welcome you to Oak Street Baptist Church. Uh, you are going to find, if you're new here, in the seat back in front of you, a welcome packet. Um, if you have not been here before, we'd invite you to take a minute to pull that out and look over it. It has some information about who we are as a church and there's a little tear-off section in there, if you wouldn't mind grabbing that and filling that out for us this morning. It should take only a minute. That can be your gift to us today. You're going to find around the edge of the sanctuary some offering boxes. You can just drop that in there. Again, we're, we're so grateful that you have chosen to join us in worship today. Um, I have a special guest that is going to do announcements with me this morning in honor of VBS. Let me just grab him real quick. Everyone, uh, this is Wally the Wombat, who's going to be doing announcements with me today. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Okay, uh, hold on. Let me just adjust, adjust the voice thermometer here, right in the back. It's good to see you all here today. No, nope, hold on. Hello, kids. It's good to see you here today. I'm so glad that you're going to join us for VBS. Yes, we're excited about that but I have some other things that I have to talk about first. And then when we get to VBS, I'm going to turn it over to you. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, that's all right. Okay, so um, first off, our, our mission team from the Yucatan is back. Uh, yes. So they landed late last night. Um, and uh, we're so excited to hear about uh, coming up, the things that God accomplished in them and through them. But real quick, uh, if you were a part of the mission team that went to the Yucatan, could, we, could you stand uh, so we could just honor you real quick this morning? Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, Zoom, okay, this is, this is your time to shine. Are you ready? I'm ready for this. All right, here we go. VBS. VBS is coming up, kids. Um, it's coming up tomorrow, actually, is when it's going to start. Uh, real quick, Stephen, I'm looking out here, and I don't see a lot of kids. Uh, where are all the kids? So we, across the street, we have something that's called Kids Church, and Miss Dana, oh, I love Miss Dana. She's wonderful. Yes, she is doing VB, she's doing Kids Church across the street, so that's where the kids are. Okay, and what are all these... Uh, these people that look like bigger kids. These are called adults. I know you may not interact with them very much, but they're, this is what kids turn into as they, as they get older. Oh, okay, all right. Um, could you just stick maybe to the script? Okay, yeah, just let me look. Yeah, I still can't read. We're just going to wing it. Here we go. So two things for VBS you need to know. Number one is this. If you haven't signed up yet, you kiddos, you're done for. You can't sign up anymore. No, that's not it, Wally. Okay, they can sign up. Online registration, oh yeah, that's right. Online registration is closed. And so you can't sign up there. You need to sign up in person tomorrow night. Okay, that's it. And the second thing, yes. If you have volunteered to work VBS, but you have not yet signed up your kiddos, you are in trouble. Miss Dana is not happy with you. So what you need to do is you need to give her a call and put on your best apology voice and say, Miss Dana, I'm sorry. I didn't sign up my kids. I need you to help me out. And she will, she'll take care of it, okay? Yes. Are you excited about, can you tell them about like what we're actually going to be doing and stuff? Yes. We're going to go to the land down under and we're going to talk about Jesus and it's going to be wonderful and you should all be there. I'm so excited. We have like 150 kids signed up. It's going to be a wonderful time. And again, it's just, just please be praying. If you're not going to be here, be praying for it, that God would do a mighty work in our midst. Yes. Very good. You did a good job, Wally. Thank you. Um <laughs> So Wednesday nights uh, are going to be postponed this week due to VBS. Um, again, we love what we do on Wednesday nights, but this is really important. We have all hands on deck, um, except for Celebrate Recovery is going to continue to meet this week. They had a wonderful launch last week. Um, we are so excited about this ministry um, in our church, in our community. And so please be, continue to pray for Celebrate Recovery, that God would use this um, to just be a, a wonderful thing 
that ministers to those in our community. Family camp is coming up, and I want to tell you this. Um, it's coming up July 7th through the 10th. This is your last chance to sign up for family camp. If you have not signed up yet, um, Wednesday is the deadline. And so if you've been thinking about it, if you're on the fence, we would really, really love for your family to be a part of this wonderful camp that we put on. Um, Again, it's a great time for the family to be together, to worship, um, to fellowship, just to spend time with the rest of our church family. And so this is July 7th through 10th, so please sign up if you have not yet already. Um, We are having an important family forum that's coming up. In a couple of weeks, uh, June 26th at 5 p.m., we're asking that uh, just all of Oak Street would be there uh, for this important meeting. And so that's going to be at 5 p.m. coming up in a couple weeks. And then we want to encourage you, um, after Lifetime, every Sunday, we're having a time of prayer in the sanctuary at 1215 um, for our future pastor and for this process. And so if you would like to, we'd love for you to join us uh, after Lifetime to pray uh, for the important things that are that are going on in the life of our church. You can check your bulletins for the rest of the things that I didn't mention up here. And uh, with that, I'm going to invite Amy and Lacey Rexford up to continue our service with scripture and prayer. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Lacey. This is my wife, Amy. Uh, as you know, we got Vacation Bible School coming up next week. Um, Amy and I, over the years, have had the chance to uh, serve in many different areas of our church, uh, but there has been none that has blessed us more or brought us so much joy than working with these kids. Um, Amy's going to read a uh, passage out of Mark, and then afterwards we're going to have a special prayer for all those that are working Vacation Bible School next week. I'm going to read Mark 10:13 through 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. If you're going to be um, working at Vacation Bible School next week, we're just going to ask that you please stand so that uh, during this prayer so that uh, we can pray over you. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the fellowship that we have with each other. We thank you for the fellowship that we have with you. Father, as we uh, look forward to Vacation Bible School next week, I just want to pray for everyone who is uh, giving their time for these kids. Just ask for wisdom, for strength, Father, for patience, and I just ask that you will bless them as they bless, bless these kids. Father, next week we're going to have a lot of kids coming to us that we don't always see some of the kids who have, uh, may never have been, been to church, many kids who don't know you. Father, we just ask that the seeds that are planted next week, Lord, that you will one day cause to bear fruit. We just um, ask that you will be glorified more than anything, Father. We pray that you will bless our time this morning. We give you all the praise. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, the rest of you stand up and uh, shake a hand there close to you. Tell somebody how glad you are they're they're here at Oak Street this morning. Tell them they need to come to VBS. Bring their kids. worship your love oh lord is strength to my 
Every door, write it on every wall, sing it in every room. Open up every door. Calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up.
your children. You hear your children. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answer prayers, man. And you will answer. We sing this next song. I want to open up the altar. God has always been faithful. We just need to call to remembrance all the things that he's done. And so this morning, bring your gratitude before the Lord, your thankfulness. Remember what he's done. And if you need him now, if you if you have something in your life that's going on and you just need the Lord right now, to come and bring that before his throne. Finding myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's okay the last thing I need is to be heard but to hear what you are saying it's the word of God speak but you pour down like a rain Washing my eyes to see your majesty. Be still and know you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God speaks. my 
myself in the midst of you beyond the music beyond the noise and all that I need is to be with you and in the quiet Lord, we do enter into the rest, the peace of God today with our struggles, with our issues, with our conflicts. Father, with everything life throws at us, Lord, we run to you and you are the strong tower in which we take refuge. And Lord, no matter if the storm is raging or it's peace and calm, God, we, we trust in you. We, we choose to, to stay, Lord, in that place. That place of rest, that place of trust, that place of victory. Lord, we pray this morning... God, I'm praying specifically that the Word of God would change our lives. That the Spirit of God would take the Word and brand it upon our hearts. That we might be forever changed. Lord, Your Word and Your Spirit give life. Give us Your life today, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you. Be seated. Y'all are in for a blessing uh, today. Kelly, Lanham, and I, God's given us a, a privilege, and we're kind of ringside. We're on the front row of seeing God do a powerful work in, in a man's life. And I've asked uh, Matt Dickey if he would come and just share with you a little bit of what God's doing in his heart. So, Matt, let's welcome Matt. Good morning, guys. You bet. Um, so, yeah, Matthew Dickey's my name. Uh, 48 years old, wife of 24 years, two kids. I'm a Christian. Uh, been saved, baptized, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior years and years ago. Um, since then, I've had some stuff uh, that, that this morning the task was, okay, where were you, where are you at now, and, and more importantly, where are you going? That was kind of the, the theme of what we've been talking about. So where I was at before, like I say, I was a Christian, no doubt about it. Basically, uh, show up on Sundays and get one hour a week and call it good. It's kind of what happens. Um, don't know Scripture, don't know the Bible, don't know Guys, I, I, don't, I don't know it. I don't have the, the books of the Bible memorized. I don't know what's in the New Testament and what's in the Old Testament. I got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Genesis and Revelations, and everything else kind of falls in between. That's kind of where I'm at. 
Um, but I had some, something happen that was kind of weird, and, and I, knew, uh, I knew it wasn't me. We had a family member that we're not close with, never have been. Three or four times in 25 years, we've talked. He called us out of the blue and said, hey, man, we're going to come down for the weekend. And I was like, oh, man, not, not really. Uh, I really don't want you to. If that's all right, stay back. Um, <laughs> I say that lighthearted. We knew he was going through some troubles. We knew that his kid, we, we, I said, all right, yeah, come on down. We'll see what we got. And he came down, and uh, I had... I had a wall built up. I, had, I said, this guy's coming down to get his hooks in us. He's going to hit us with, man, a guy to DWI, uh, can't pay it, going to need some money, kids are sick, so, you know, something. I, I had this big wall of negativity. Uh, come down, met his son, hadn't met him but a couple of times, and uh, we had a blast. Well, later on that afternoon, Kayla, my wife, she made a Made us bologna sandwiches, uh, pork and beans, and laced potato chips. Kind of the, the lunch of champions. I mean, it was really having a good time. And, and I, didn't, I didn't really, I mean, we just kind of blessed our food. And I said, hey, you know, I know our guest, Rance, family members, having some struggles, having some, some troubles. Lord, if you would, let this food bless our body and, and answer some of Rance's needs, questions, be there for him. You know, uh, just kind of reach out. And I look up. His son looks like a deer in the headlights. He got I mean, his eyes are wide open. He's seven years old, eight years old. And I look over at Rance, and he's in full-blown crocodile tears. I was like, oh, man, now what? Uh, so I said, hey, he says, we'll talk later. I said, well, let's come to church with us. The next morning, that was on a Saturday. The next morning was Sunday. I said, hey, come to church with us, kind of see where we're at. Well, Sunday morning, we came to church, but he and his son wasn't awake. I asked Kayla, I said, should we wake him up? He says, no, let him, let him be. So we, I didn't bring him to church. Man, that bothered me. I was like, oh, man, I missed an opportunity. Was that the one shot? You know, I mean, what happened? So Monday morning, I beeline into Pastor Joe's office and said, here's what happened. I think I dropped the ball. Here's where we're at. He said, no, man, you got to let him do his thing. You know, it's, it's, it wasn't you that did it. It wasn't the power of the bologna sandwich, I can promise you. <laughs> Uh, he, uh, so I kind of dropped it and we started talking and I started kind of asking myself, what's next? You know, I, I, I'm not in the Bible. I'm not in scripture. I'm not in, I go through the motions. I'm, I show up at church, but there's gotta be more, you know? So I asked that question. I said, Hey, Pastor Joe's, what's next? He said, I got something for you. We're going to start a little discipleship group, Kelly and Pastor Joe and I, and I'd like you to come. It's like, all right, good. I'll do that. So we started that. So that's where I was at, Christian, uh, going through the motions, Sunday only, one hour a week kind of guy. Uh, now we got our discipleship group. We meet for one hour once a week. And the first time ever was last week. We went to our first lifetime group. So in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I've tripled my production now a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I go from one hour a week to three hours a week. Life is getting better. And, uh, and I tell you, it is. So I, I still don't know any scriptures. I, I know stories of the Bible. I listen to church, and I take some notes occasionally. But, you know, I, I, I don't know. If you was to ask me, hey, you know, open it up to Timothy, I got to ask. Well, okay, front, front of the Bible, middle of the Bible, best thing it says, hey, if you just start in the middle and open up, it's two pages over, I'm that guy. Uh, so anyway, I'm, but I'm getting better, and we got some stuff going. So then the question was, where are we going from here? What's next? Uh, I'm kind of a numbers guy, kind of weird on stuff like that. Everything's got to make sense for me to do it. Uh, so I started looking. There's about 8,700 hours in a year, right at. I figure if I work eight, sleep eight, that leaves eight. Breaking that down, there's about 2,600 hours left. Right now, I've tripled my production, and I'm at 150 hours. There's a lot of hours to improve, a lot of hours I can grow to. Well, so I sit there and I said, okay, man, what's a realistic goal? 2,600 hours for me is not realistic. I can't sit there every time I wake up, don't eat, don't sleep, that I'm in the scripture. It's, it's, I'm not that guy. Not yet. So I said, is 10% of that realistic? 10% is 260 hours. I'm at 150 hours now. I can get there. I can get to 10%. Starting block, I kid around for the kids that are in here. I'm at Kung Fu Panda level zero. That's where I'm at right now. 
but I, I want to get there, and, and I encourage you they're, they're, to see it work in the baby steps. You don't have to do it my way. My way is probably not the right way, but get into it somewhere. Things are happening. Things are changing. Our congregation's growing. I see the smiling face. I see the kids. I see vacation Bible study. I, there's a lot of things happening. So, you know, take the same steps. Once again, I, I, I'm not sure I'm the guy to follow, but I'll tell you what Jesus is. And that scripture is, is, is what it's about. There's, there's stories. I asked Pastor Joe, and I'll say it, I hope this is not, I'm not going to take over my three minutes, but uh, you know, I, I, sometimes when people raise their hands in church, I don't understand it. I said, when people come up here and lay hands, I, I, man, I'm like, what are we doing? You know, when people lay their, 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 their prayers down at the altar, I'm like, I can do that from my seat. I've, I've said that. I don't understand it. But you know what was crazy? And I asked that same question in, in our discipleship program, and without hesitation, they went straight to Scripture. It's in there. So my wants and fears and my restrictions, those barriers can be broke right through Scripture. I saw it firsthand. So, you know, take a challenge, you know, and then I said, okay, 10%, that's a big number. Hate to circle back around, but if you know that there's 365 days in a year, you give yourself one day, one hour a day for a year, that's 365 days. So I'm not even, I'm not even starting at an hour a day. I'm below that at 256. When I hit it, we'll go to the next level. So if y'all feel like me, if there's ever been anybody that had that same spot and questions or whatever, get into Scripture. There, there's something there, guys. Don't have it figured out. Won't claim to have it figured out. I'll tell you, the book does. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. You know, I don't want to always say, oh, you know, look how the Lord put things together. But from what I, I'm going to share, which I didn't share any of that with Matt, what he shared, I mean, this is a dovetail. God has given us a one-two this morning, okay? What I have to share fits right exactly along with what, what Matt shared. So I know that God is trying to speak to us to get our attention. So let's open our Bibles to 2 Timothy. Matt, that's kind of at the back. Uh, toward the back, not all the way to the back, but kind of. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll look at verses 12 through 17. We're continuing our series, All in All. A church that is built on the great commandment and the great commission is not going to be far off from what God wants us to do. And it's interesting to me that in the great commandment and the great commission, the word all is used repeatedly. For example, the great commandment. They asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment in the Bible? Here's, here's his response. Hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now, most of us, if we say, I'm doing it with all my heart, we think we're, we're doing great. But look, Jesus goes beyond that. He's saying with your, with your emotions or your passion, with your thinker, with your chooser, with your doer, with, with everything in you, love God. That's the all. Is it obvious to people that you're a lover of God? I mean, the people that you work with and the people that know you, not just that you go to Oak Street Baptist Church, but that you truly love God with that intensity. And then there's the Great Commission. One of the last things Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing in them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything or all things I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Think about that. All authority, all nations, all commands, at all times and places. No wonder he's called the God of all. Let me give you one more all, and this is where we're going this morning. All Scripture. 
all scripture. It's a very famous verse. We're going to be looking at it this morning. John Piper uh, is a pastor, theologian, uh, emissary, uh, spokesman for a great part of evangelical Christianity. He has deeper thoughts at breakfast than I have when I'm having a quiet time. I mean, this guy is a deep well. He's, got a, he's a brilliant mind and, and, and a, a great heart. Here's, here's a quote I want to give to you from John Piper. He said, it's impossible to overestimate the value of the Bible. It is of infinite worth. And many of us here would say, yeah, I agree, yeah, the Bible, the, great, the Bible has a lot of value. The Bible has great value. That's not what he said. What he said was, it is of infinite worth. You see, in our culture, which is postmodern, we're, uh, most people, the Bible is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. If they have one on the bookshelf or on the coffee table, but, but most people don't even have that. For some of us, we would say, that, you know, the Bible is, uh, it is valuable. It is important. It's needful. But we, we kind of have it like this. The Bible is one of the tools in the chest. And God's given me common sense. And God's given me prayer. And God's given me a, a study group. And God's given me the church. And He's given me, I have all these things. And the Bible is, is one of those things that I can draw on, a tool that I can use. Well, cards on the table, I want to tell you this morning, here's, here's my goal. Before the clock strikes 1130, for you to say, the, my Bible is the most important physical possession that I have. It's more important than my house, my car, land, portfolio, bank accounts, all those things that I have. There's one thing that's more important than any of that, and that's the Word of God, the Bible that I carry. For example, let's just say your house is on fire and everything you've got in your life is in that house. What do you, what do you get to pull out? The Bible, the Word of God. It's priority. It's the most important thing in my life if I don't have anything else. If I don't drive a nice car, if I don't live in a big house, if I don't have this or that, I am going to have the Word of God in my hand and in my heart. Psalm 119.72, the law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. And I want to do something this morning, just, I hope it helps, just start off by just sharing you at least 12 different ways or 12 different things in our life that makes the Word of God invaluable. The first is faith. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. You see, our trust is birthed, it's nurtured, it's strengthened, it's purified and solidified by the Word of God. Our faith, faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? The Word of God. The second thing is hope. Remember the word your, serv your word to your servant, for you have given me hope. Hope is the expectation of good. And we're living in a time today when a lot of people are becoming more and more gripped by hopelessness. We hear things, we see things, we experience things, and our, our expectation of good is lessening. Well, the Bible is filled with stories, principles, all kinds of, of promises that give us hope. The third thing is joy. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. Listen, Jeremiah had a tough ministry. I mean, he was harassed, he was beaten, he was slandered, he was accused. I mean, just on and on repeatedly. But he said, in all of this, in all this discouragement, and all this abuse... I have joy in my heart. There is a delight in my heart. What is it? It's the Word of God. The fourth thing is wisdom. Proverbs 1.1 1, 1, The proverb of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight. Proverbs 4.7 Wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. 
Proverbs 8.10, choose my instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than pure gold. For wisdom is more valuable than anything. Nothing you have can compare, compare to it. And, and one of the things, as you know, we're transitioning in life, looking for, for the, the, the new place that God uh, is calling my wife and I. I'm telling you, people say, what can I do to help you? You know what I say? Wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Just pray. If you're going to pray, thank you. Pray for wisdom specifically. Number five, freedom. John 8, verse 31. The Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, then you're truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And a lot of times we read something like that, we go, oh yeah, those addictions, you know, those life-controlling habits. It's, it's not just that. It's looking at the total, uh, you know, the total circumference of our life and being freed from bitterness, greed, fear, jealousy, anxiety, anger, angst, materialism. And not only are we free from these things, but we're free to be the person God created us to be. I know, you know, I don't get all excited going, oh, okay, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. But when I think, God, you want me to be free to be everything you created me to be, man, that, that's exciting to me. And the freedom is found in the Word of God. Number six, life. The, Jesus said, the Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. He's not talking about biological life. He's not talking about cellular growth and these kind of things. He's talking about the life of God, the word zoe. The word and the Spirit give us the life of God and the life that God has for us. Number seven, encouragement. Paul writes in Romans 15, 4, everything that was written for the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught by the Scripture and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Encouragement to live for God in a godless world. Encouragement to know that, that God has a plan and a purpose for my life. Encouragement that I matter, I make a difference. God is using me and wants to use me to make a difference in this world. Number eight, holiness. John 17, 17. Jesus said, sanctify them through truth. Set them apart for your purposes. Make them holy. That's the, the Amplified Bible. Your word is truth. What is it that pollutes and poisons, poisons us? Body, soul, and spirit. What is it that, that diminishes us? That distracts us? That destroys or disconnects our life? Years ago, I had a man in my Bible study, and he was, he was going through some really, really bad problems in his marriage. And him and his wife, they were growing further apart day by day. And he came to me, and he said, I just got to be honest with you. He said, there's this lady at work, and, you know, I've really become interested in her. What should I do? I didn't jump up and down and start screaming and yelling at him. I said, here's what you do. You go read Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, and you'll know exactly what to do. He came back to me. He said, I'm going to work on my marriage. I'm going to restore my relationship with my wife. The Word of God has told me exactly what's going on. Number nine, strength. The psalmist said, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your Word. You see, the Word of God is food. It's fuel. It's fiber for our soul. And I don't know how long you think you, know, you can go without food minutes or maybe hours but most of us like Matt said we can go a long time without the word of God I mean we kind of have a hall of fame how long people have left their bible at church before they start looking for it and and Jesus said in Matthew 4 4 man does not live on bread alone every word that proceeds from the mouth of God Jesus went 40 days without physical food. I bet he didn't go an hour without the Word of God. Number 10, victory. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6 is the armor of God that we put on, but there are two offensive weapons. 
the Word of God, and prayer. And that's how we go on the offense. And that's how we win the victory. Let me, let me give, you a, give you something you may not know. You're not a punching bag for the devil. We come to church, oh man, oh, I'm taking a beating, boy, pray for my family, we're on the ropes, oh, everything's going to be, you know, we just, it's just like we just sit there and let, let the enemy just punch and pound away until, until something just falls apart. And God says, no, I, I created you for victory. You're not just in the battle, I've created you to be victorious in the battle. Seven times in Revelation, it says to those who are overcomers, to those who are victorious. And that's what God makes us with the Word of God. Number 11 is peace. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. The Bible will calm our anxieties. It will restore peace of mind. It will give us this sense of well-being that, that the Bible calls peace. John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have told you so that in me you will have peace. And then the last one is reward. Psalm 19, 10 and 11. They, being the word of God, is more precious than gold, much pure gold, sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them is your servant warned, and in keeping them is great reward. We talked in discipleship this past week that first in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about that which is gold, silver, and precious stones. That that which will last. Now, there are rewards in this life that we get. God God has so many blessings and rewards in this life. But not only in this life. Even a cup of cold water in my name, Jesus said, will not lose its reward. And so, as we read, study, memorize, and meditate on the Word of God, we see those things that will receive a heavenly reward. And there's nothing, nothing wrong with having that in your DNA. God made us that way. All the way from a little child to a, to a senior adult. Now, what, what I've done, and this, listen, this is the short list. These are just 12 things. I mean, what is peace worth? What is joy worth? What are all the things we talked about? They all have infinite worth, and, and that's just 12 of them. 12 benefits, 12 blessings, 12 rewards from being in the Word of God. Now we're going to take this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and and expand on it. So Paul, writing to the young pastor Timothy, his son in the faith, he begins chapter 3 by talking about the end times, and that's a big topic today. And, and, And then he talks about the persecution, the suffering, the hostility toward the gospel. And then he writes this, 2 Timothy 3.12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know, that, you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And then that famous verse in in the New Testament, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man or the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Remember the goal. 30 minutes from now, That you'll say, by the grace of God, you'll say, the Bible, my Bible, is my most important physical possession in life. So let's let's look at the value of the Bible. Number one, the conditions. The downhill spiral of our culture. Paul writes, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Evildoers and imposters Go from bad to worse, deceive, deceived and being deceiving and being deceived. I had a lady in our community that I respect very much this week. You know what she told me? She said, Graham is changing. My husband and I are looking for somewhere else to go. I, I've lived here 26 years and I had never heard that. You see, 
we used to be in this bubble, this rural, small town, Bible Belt community. And we had this bubble and we kind of had our things going on and, 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 and we were protected. We, we felt safe. But now through media and social media and, 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 and iPhones and mobility and everything, we're, we're now an open target. An open target for the world to unleash evil on us. And I'm not saying that to scare anybody like, ooh, look out. I'm not doing that. But listen, there's a great, there's a great uh, benefit to being self-aware and to be a, aware of the times in which we live. Sinful things are ramping up in fervor, frequency, and fierceness. And there are two things Paul talks about here. There will be an increase in persecution. In the 50s, where I was born and you know, where my life kind of got going in the 50s, there was this, it was church friendly. I mean, everything kind of supported that. Even when I went to school on Monday morning, the teacher would ask, how many of you went to Sunday school? How many of you went to church? And a great majority of us did. In fact, it was kind of odd if, if someone didn't. Then the 60s and 70s became this indifference to Christianity. But for the last 40 years, it's turned to antagonism and hostility. I sit, I sit loyal something when he was down in the Yucatan. We work in Kampala, Uganda. And right on the edge of that, there was a pastor. And he decided him and his, churches would, or him and his church would go evangelize the neighborhood. So they took Bibles and tracts. And radical Muslims got a hold of him and they beat him to death with axes and hatchets. Now, you say, well, that's halfway around the world. Folks, it's, it's coming here. I mean, they are arresting Christians now for hate speech. Preaching the gospel. Sharing the truths from God's word. And they're saying, oh yeah, that hate speech. It's, it leads to, to hate actions hate behavior, so we've got to nip it in the bud. There will be an increase in persecution, but there will be an increase in perversion. The two definitions of perversion are, number one, a distortion, a corruption of what is first intended. Marriage, perverted. Male and female roles, sexuality, perverted. The second definition of perversion is sexual behavior regarded as abnormal or unacceptable. Do you think the devil gets pleasure in seeing what was a symbol of God's promise to us? The covenant keeping God promise of a rainbow? Now a gay pride symbol? Now the, the symbol of perversion? In that twisted, demented way, I'm sure the devil's going, isn't this awesome? Isn't this great? Nobody thinks about the promises of God anymore. Nobody thinks about the covenant-keeping God anymore. They're all thinking about the LGBTQI plus agenda. And another question. Does the devil enjoy that the mystery of marriage talked about in Ephesians 5? is now same-sex marriage, polygamy, open-ended marriage, human beings marrying animals, plants, objects. I mean, what a, what a horrible twist and perversion on the beauty of God and the goodness of God and the truth of God's Word. I'm just, I'm just saying those are the conditions you and I are living in. It ain't the 1950s anymore, folks. The second thing I want to talk about is conviction. What we truly believe to be true. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. Now, a conviction is a deeply held belief that affects the way we live. And there are, you know, biblical convictions that everybody has. And then there are also convictions that you have personally. When I first became a Christian, I, I really had this deep conviction 
that, the, that Sunday was God's day and to, to set that apart and not do work, things like this. Well, we moved to Florida, and every job I was offered, they said, but you have to work on Sunday. And I said, well, uh, I'm not going to do that. And, I mean, it was just like, well, wow, what's the big deal? Well, to me, it was a big deal. Paul says some people consider every day the same, and no problem with that. But to some people, one day is holy, and that was me. And so, so I just, man, I just felt the funnel, you know, just narrowing down to, to almost close. And then God opened the perfect door for me where I could live by my convictions, which I was going to anyway. Fast forward to that, years and years later, my grandson's got a basketball game. I said, I'm going to be there, man. I can't wait to watch you play. This is the first chance I get to watch you play. This is going to be great. And then they changed the schedule. Guess what? Play it on Sunday. And I sit down with my grandson. I sit down and said, let me explain to you about my convictions. And yes, Papa said he was going to be there, but I'm not going to be there, and I want you to know why. And I'm just, I, I'm just saying, Paul talks to Timothy and he says, your convictions, the things that you're convinced of, that you truly believe, don't water those down, don't abandon those, don't compromise those. In 2 Timothy 1.5, he said, you were taught by your mother Eunice, you were taught by your grandmother Lois. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, you were taught by me, the things you've heard in the presence of many witnesses. These entrust to others that they may teach others also. The point is simply this. Paul says, or says to Timothy, hey, the three most trusted people in your life have taught you and have brought you to this place. You can trust us and you can trust the Word of God. My convictions mold me. What are, what are convictions? They're the day-to-day -day value system that we live with. For example, honesty, hard work, love, kindness, humility, generosity. And every day, in every way, the, the convictions that we have shape and mold our life. They bring us stronger. They make it, for example, Luke 9.23. If anyone would come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And so we choose to live by that conviction or we live by just being selfish, self-centered, self-promoting. But you see those two, those two convictions, those two values will take you two different directions. I'll never forget when my children were young, one of my kids came to me and said, Dad, it's so hard to live with convictions. Can we not do that? Why do we do that, Dad? I says, because our convictions are what make us us. Who we are and what we are is because of the convictions that we hold to. My convictions motivate, motivate me. You see, one of my convictions is that every person should be treated with respect. That's a personal conviction of mine. Another is that nobody will get to heaven apart from Jesus. You see, when I put those two convictions together... It, 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 it guides my conversation. It guides my relationships, my interactions, things that I say, things that I respond to, ways I listen. Just those, just those two convictions change every, every area, motivate me in every area of my life. And here's, here's the point I'm getting to from the scripture that we just read. Between parents and street kids, an open door Christian school and our church and a lot of others. You see, we just all work together. And we say, we say to our children and grandchildren, not just this is what we believe, but this is why we believe it. And just like Timothy, as he grew up, that, that truth of God's word, the convictions of God's Word, it molds and shapes us. And I'm telling you, our children are growing up in a crazy, insane world. And if we don't give them biblical truth, biblical convictions, there's, there's no way they're going to stand. The third is conversion. The progression of God's Word on our lives. Paul says to Timothy, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise 
for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. When did the Word of God begin its great work in Timothy's life? The Bible says at infancy. It started in the baby bed Sunday school classroom. The Word of God continued in his childhood and brought him to salvation. And then here comes the missionary Paul through town. And he singles out Timothy and says, go with me. And so this deep discipleship process continues. And then when Paul is in prison, here goes Timothy. As an evangelist, as a pastor, as a leader, as a teacher. In Philippians 2.20, Paul said about Timothy, he said, I have no one like him. The Word of God has shaped his life. The Word of God has, has molded his life. And there's no one else in my life like Timothy because of the effect of the Word of God. His whole life infused, empowered, ingrained with the Word of God. The Bible gives us pictures of faith. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I don't believe Timothy was a theologian in pre-K. Okay, I don't know that. It doesn't say it. But I've just, that's just my hunch. That is a three and four and five year old he wasn't a, a, a worldwide theologian first peter 2 2 and 3 says like newborn infants crave the pure spiritual milk that you might grow up to salvation and one of the things the bible does for us is it gives us pictures word pictures and illustrations of faith and we could go through the whole long list, but let's just name a couple. The story of Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. The story of Moses and the Red Sea, Gideon and the 300 warriors. David and Goliath, Daniel and the lion's den. Jesus and the 5,000, Paul and Silas in prison, John on Patmos. You see, all of those things build and fuel our faith. God has, has given us this this mind that works with stories. Everybody loves a good story. And God takes these stories of faith. And as we teach them to our children and to their children, they grow up with these pictures of faith. This is what the faith life, life looks like. It looks like a little shepherd boy, David, taking on Goliath. It looks like a man so convicted and so convinced of God that he's willing to be thrown into the lion's den rather than to quit praying. And picture after picture, story after story, it's building our children. And I don't know what your bedtime stories are to your children or what you talk about in times, but I'm telling you, these Bible stories will change lives. These Bible stories will build into their life what nothing else will. The Bible gives us pictures of faith, but it also gives us principles of faith. Isaiah 28.10, line upon line, precept upon precept. The guiding principles of our life. You see, the value of principles is they work every time for everybody in every situation. They're, they're uh, uh, absolutely universal in their truth. Galatians 6, 6 and 7, do not, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. You see, with one principle from the Word of God, it's got a thousand applications. I mean, every day in life, if I just take that one principle and go, what do I want out of life? What do I want out of relationships? What do I want out of work? What do I want out of, out of all these different areas? I go, well, I reap what I sow. I'm going to sow love. I'm going to sow kindness. I'm going to sow trust. I'm going to sow encouragement. And as, as I do that, it will come back on my life. Paul says the Word of God makes you wise for salvation. And yes, I know Christianity is, a, is, is not rules and regulations. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. But the Word of God sets, sets us up for that. The Word of God says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. That's the, that's the point. That's the thing that takes us for, uh, to a need for a Savior. And so the Word of God is not like, okay, here's the Word of God and here's, here's Jesus. Pick one or the other. It's not either or. It's both and. The fourth truth is the, 
the content, the influences of God's Word on our lives. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Bible is not a book that man wrote about God. It's a book God wrote about Himself and about us. And He used, you know, around 40 different men But He breathed the truth through them. It's like the words you're hearing from me right now. What is it? My breath is going over the vocal cords. And it's producing words. And that's what the Bible is. God breathed on men's lives. And like vocal cords, they wrote down truths and principles and stories that we can live our life by. Moses giving us the Torah David, half the Psalms, Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Sixteen major major and minor prophets in the Old Testament. The four gospel accounts, Peter, Paul, James, and John, all giving us sacred writings. From Nero to Vespucian to Trajan to Diocletian, they did everything that they could think of to destroy the Word of God. The enemy knew that in in infancy, the church and our faith would not survive without the Word of God. Theodore Beza said this, The Bible is the anvil that has broken many hammers. God's Word transcends us. It transcends us. Psalm 119.89, Your Word is eternal. It stands forever in the heavens. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Isaiah 48, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God will last forever. Now folks, we live in this this culture of 24-hour news cycles. And this is, this is so, so, so important. You just can't quit thinking about this, and 24 hours later, it's something else. And then it's something else. And then it's something else. The Word of God is eternal. It's it's transcendent. Every time we hear, read, study, memorize, meditate, or obey the Word of God, we are investing in that which is eternal. We're giving our life to that which will never end. And just say, well, I just kind of read my Bible. and just No, no, no. You invested. You open your heart, you open your mind up to the eternal Word of God. And whether the change was little or great, you are still investing in that which can never be destroyed. God's Word transcends us. 3,500 years ago to 3,500 years in the future and beyond. The Word of God is eternal. Secondly, God's Word transforms us. It is profitable. It is useful for teaching. Just how how do you live life? We, We don't have little footprints, you know, all over the place that tell us where to go. God's Word teaches us how to live, rebuking the warnings. The warnings of God stay away from that. That will destroy you. That will, that will, uh, uh, it will damage relationships. The correcting or the tutoring. God not only says this is wrong, He says here's how to get it correct. Here's how to get back on the path. And then training, the application of God's Word. The Word of God is spiritual crossfit. The Word of God will take you from that 90 pound weakling to a, to a superhero. The Word of God will empower us. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. God's Word changes our neural pathways. God's Word changes the attitudes of our heart. God's Word changes our value system. It changes our perspective on life. And the last thing this morning is this. 
capacity, the potential of God's Word on our lives. All Scripture is God-breathed, is profitable for teaching, reproving, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I got this word capacity. I got it from some millennials I know. They're always talking about people. They're going, hey, he's high capacity. He's high capacity. She's high capacity. What they're saying is they, they can do a lot of things well. You know, they really have it together. Listen, whether you're high capacity or low capacity, God will take whatever you have and the Word of God will bring out the potential that He's placed within us. He will maximize that. Whether you're a missionary, a mechanic, an evangelist, an engineer, a CEO, or a caretaker of your parents. The Bible infuses us with wisdom, understanding, insight, and knowledge. The Bible will equip us. That word literally means to prepare perfectly, to equip for special purposes. You know the old joke is babies didn't didn't come with a set of instructions. Oh yes, they did. It's called the Bible. We all have a set of instructions. We all have a word that teaches us how to live our lives. It's the Word of God. There are two ways to face the future. One is just wait because it will happen anyway. The other is to get prepared. Get into God's Word. Let God prepare your heart and, and your mind. Paul says to Timothy, the Word of God will thoroughly equip you for every good work. The Bible empowers us. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Everything God wants you to do. And as Patty and I are transitioning, getting ready to head in this, this new aspect, I mean, I just thought I was busy. I mean, I used to look at a, you know, a long list of things to do and it would empower it and it you know, kind of just challenged me. And lately, it's just been overwhelming. I mean, just all these things that are changing in our life and all these things that, that are brand new. We've never been there, never done these kind of things. And the other day, I was just, I was just you know, kind of that mind spinning, thinking about a hundred different things. And God spoke to me by His Spirit. And He said this, Don't neglect the Word of God. That's gold, folks. That's gold. I'm so busy. I'm a shaker and a mover. I'm a getter done. I'm a, I'm a go-getter, all these things. Listen, without the Word of God, it's for naught. Without the Word of God, you're, you're, yeah, you're climbing the ladder, but it's on the wrong wall. I stole that, okay. <laughs> not that clever. The fact is we are not going to be effective in life without the Word of God. And so here's where... Here's where Matt and I overlap. Here's where I had no idea what he was going to say, but I said, oh my goodness, that's exactly what I'm going to challenge our people to. You see, there are three things you can do with your life. You can waste it, you can spend it, or you can invest it. Forty-six years ago, when I came to Christ, I was a Bible illiterate. I knew nothing of the Word of God. My brother-in-law had given me a Bible. I went and set it on, a, on a, a, a college minister's desk and said, I know nothing about this book. Will you please teach me? The very first quiet time I had, you know what I did? I went to the table of contents and tried to learn that just so I'd have some idea where books of the Bible were. And the second quiet time I had was John chapter 1. I mean, I thought it couldn't get any simpler than that. And I started there, and the Word of God started to take effect and hold in my life. The best decision I ever made as a Christian was to spend time every day in the Word of God. And I exactly agree with Matt. I don't, you know, his, his mathematics are better than mine by far. And figuring percentages and this and that, that's, you know, that, I'm, I'm not up there, okay? I'm not a high-capacity guy like that. But for me, it was simple. Yes, I'll spend at least five minutes every day in God's Word. I don't know what five times 365 times 46 is, but that's, a, that's the minimum time that God has worked in my heart and my life. 
And so here's, here's the commitment. I will commit to investing how much of my life each day in God's Word. Before you jump up and say, I'm going I'm to do three hours a day. Ecclesiastes 5, 4 says, When you make a vow to God, do not delay in, to fulfill it. God takes no pleasure in fools. Fulfill what you vow. It's better not to make a vow than to make it and not fulfill it. I heard about an old prospector. Spent his life up on the mountain, living in his little cabin and prospecting for gold. And when he died and his kids came to the, to the shack and they went through it to get everything that was valuable. They took his frying pan, they took his chair, uh, chair, they took his pistol, they took these things. As they were leaving, this old prospector's best friend walked up and they said, we took everything that has value. You can have anything that's left. As they walked off, this old friend walked into the house. He pried up one of the planks of the floor. And underneath it was all the gold that this man had ever found prospecting. Folks, there's gold in this, this here book. This here book is full to overflowing of gold. The gold that God wants to give you to make you and I who He created us to be. To do everything God created us to do. This is not just one of the tools. This is what God has given us. And said get into this word. Hear it, read it, study it, memorize, meditate. Obey this word. And your life will be rich and your life will be full. What will your life be like if you choose every day. To open your mind and your heart and your soul. To the word of God. Listen, there's still a lot, uh, still a lot of things in here I don't quite understand, or I probably, you know, couldn't pass the thousand question trivia test, but I know this, God's Word has changed my life, is changing my life, and will continue to change my life. Let's pray. You know, years ago, 46 years ago, as a Bible illiterate, as a brand new Christian, as someone who'd grown up in church but really had no idea of what was in the Bible, other than a few stories, I said, God, I'm going to commit myself to at least five minutes a day in your word. With no idea what God was going to do in my life. Had no idea what God's purpose was for my life. As that baby, baby Christian. I said, God. I will invest my life in a very small way. In your, in your word daily. And I'm not trying to push you in a corner. I'm not trying to get you somewhere that you can't get, a, get away. I'm just asking you. With all you know to be true. Will you not choose. To daily. Invest your life. In the word of God. Whatever that number is. Whatever that percentage is, whatever it looks like, just between you and God, that you will commit. I remember I was in that, that huge auditorium, five, ten thousand people there, and I felt like the only one there was me. It was just me and God, and we were making a decision. Heads bowed, eyes closed. It, obviously, if you've never received Christ, that's where it starts. That, that puts you in the, the, the starting gate. That puts, you, that puts you in the race. 
that gets you out of the stands and into the game. But it's a long game. And it's a tough game. And you're not going to win it without the Word of God. So, if you're a believer, a follower of Christ, please, I beg you, get with God. Let God deal with your heart and make the Word of God your most important physical possession in life. We're going to pray and then we'll stand and the altar's open. You do what God is calling you, speaking you, tugging at you to do. Lord, thank you for for your word, Lord. We could go on and on. I'm just getting started. I'm just starting to get revved up, God, about your word. But Lord, we've, we've, we've heard enough. We know what is right. And so, God, I do pray as you look at every heart, each heart in this, in this sanctuary this morning, that you would speak a personal, powerful word to each heart. And then you would seal that commitment by your Holy Spirit. And I would pray and ask this in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. At, uh, this, this is an invitation time. We uh, reopen the altar for, for God and you to connect if you need. Like, like Matt said, you don't have to come to the altar. But if that's what God's leading you to do, then yes, you do. Folks, you've been very...